We have a long history with maple syrup. And so this is going to talk a little bit about the history of how it came about and how strong it is here in Iowa. Um, people were shocked to hear that maple, you know, when I go out east and talk, and we talk a lot about maple syrup being in the Midwest and the premium that we get for maple syrup here and how in demand it is, they are shocked that we even have maple trees, you know. Um, so we, my family home was built in 1629. We have made syrup in the country for a long time. Commercially, we were tapping 4,000 wooden buckets in 1809. And so that was a major source of income for our family for a long time. And so a lot of the pictures you will see is they'll be from our family farm and we'll talk about the history, we'll talk about how it relates. It's one of those industries that technology is moving us forward, but it's really rooted in a, in a great tradition. Nowhere else but North America are maple trees tapped and turned into syrup. The Asian countries have maples. They do not turn it into syrup. They will tap it and it will be as a, a health drink. All right, they are drinking the sap water. So the new age of producers that are investing in maple are actually bottling the sap and shipping it overseas. The reason the USDA gave me a lot of money to do work in maple syrup is the worldwide industry is growing at six to eight percent per year, the demand for maple products. And when I tell people that, the first thing they go to is there's that many people eating pancakes. The growth is not in liquid syrup. It is in the confections. It's in maple candy. It's in maple creams. It's in maple liqueurs. It's in maple bourbons, maple beer. It's in all these maple coffee, you know, drinks. The, the market now has moved so far away from just liquid syrup that the growth potential on a local product. My family makes in the order of one to 2,000 gallons a year. 80% of it is sold on two weekends out of the farm gate with no, we don't do any advertising. It is all retail based, no marketing. They come to us, they pay cash. We have actually hired police to be there because of the fist fights that get in when we run out of certain products. And so it has changed. Very little of what we sell now is liquid syrup. And so we'll talk about that. All right, let me see if I can do this. There we go. Maybe not. Well, we'll go old school. There we go. So first thing when we start, any maple tree will make maple syrup. All right. Sugar maple and black maple here in Iowa are the primary. They're the best sugar content. Silver maple will also make maple syrup. And people always say, well, you need so much sap out of a silver maple to make a gallon of regular syrup. What we find in Iowa, our soils are so good. They are along riparian areas. We are seeing our sugar content in our silver maples equal the sugar maple that is out east. It's in that 2 to 2.2% range. And when we were here, my wife and I tapped a lot of silver maples on our farm. You can make it from red maple. You can also make it from box elder trees. Box elders are maple, Acer Nagundo. Now, Acer Nagundo has about 0.5 to 1% sugar. It takes 83 gallons to 86 gallons of raw sap to make one gallon of syrup. The boiling process, the caramelization process is so long, it has more of a thicker maple flavor to it. Red maple is, is really interesting, and there's a lot of health and nutrition scientists working with red maple. Something is different with red maple sap. It takes much longer to ferment and to spoil. So remember, sap is 2% sugar. It will ferment and spoil if you hold it for too long. So this is one of those perishable commodities. As soon as we get it, we boil it. There's something different about red maple that takes it longer to spoil. And so we are now looking at red maple in terms of how do we figure out the characteristics that are causing it not to spoil the sap, creating better candy and cream. So when sap 
begins to ferment and the bacteria begins to break things down. It creates what's called invert sugars. When you add invert sugars into the mix, it makes candy and cream more difficult. It changes the crystalline structure. But there's a fine line between let's not have the sap spoil and let's make good confections. So we're, we're studying it from the human health uh, standpoint. So let's go through the history. Uh, and Iowa had well-defined sugar camps. The, the Native Americans had well-defined sugar camps where they went every spring. They, they would wound that tree. They would collect it in some sort of vessel. And then they would begin to boil it down with heated rocks put into a hollowed log. So you can imagine the product that they had. Fly ash, bugs, dirt but it was one of the only sweeteners that they had available to them. And it, by the time the settlers came through, it was traded because it was shelf stable. Remember, anything 80% and over is not going to spoil. And so they would turn it into a, a, uh, a granulated sugar and barter with it, all right? So almost all syrup that we think of today was turned into a granulated product because they could store it, they could trade it. It was more compact and worth a lot more money. It takes a lot of time to do that. So as the explorers came, they brought with them a couple of very key advancements. One being a kettle, so you removed the fire from the actual sap, all right? So now the sap was in a kettle, they could boil it more efficiently. They had wooden buckets. Those wooden buckets were almost always made out of cucumber magnolia or basswood, something that swelled when it was exposed to water and would hold moisture. The problem with wooden buckets, as they advanced farther, they were painted. They were painted with lead-based paint. The industry has fought over the years to get rid of lead in everything we do. And, and maple is no different. We fought really hard. They also brought with them augers. So there's a lot of damage done to a tree when you would hit it with a hatchet to make the sap run every spring. That kind of girdles the tree. Well, augers really allowed us to cut a nice hole in there. The problem is those augers were also used to fix their carriage and build their house and build their barn. They were really big augers. And you can go to some of the, the sawmills in Iowa up in Northeast Iowa where they're, they're saving these logs and you can see old auger holes in some of those butt logs that have long since disappeared as the new wood grew over it. And so I had several of them bring me these auger holes and they were tap holes and they were an inch in diameter, inch and a quarter in diameter. So that is not always healthy for the tree because you're cutting that vascular structure. So, by 1818, the, the maple industry as a whole in, in America was half the cost of cane sugar, all right? They looked at this as a business to produce granulated dry sugar, all right? You can see in the picture, they've begun to figure out the process of refinement that when you start with raw sap and you boil it down and then add more raw sap, you've lost you know, you have to reheat it all and everything. What they're doing is raw sap is on the right, concentrated sap turning into syrup is on the left, and they're controlling, they're ladling from one to the next as it boils down, and then raw sap starts over. Very often you'll see a smaller kettle on the very end, which is where the finishing syrup is taking place, because as you boil sugar, it gets more and more violent. It'll boil over, it'll burn. And so they would control it more as it got into smaller kettles. By the, by the late 50s, 1850s, you saw the manufacturers that we still have today come online. And they would make metal spouts. They would make metal flat pans um, to make it more efficient. Think of a, a cauldron holding 30 or 40 gallons of sap or larger. So my family had five massive cauldrons in the woods. They would gather the taps, put them into cauldron one, start it, go to the next cauldron, fill it full, and boil it. It was an all-day process because there was very little surface area in a cauldron. As soon as you make a flat pan, you increase your surface area 
and you shallow that sap up and it boils faster. Again, anything you do in maple syrup to make it boil faster or handle it in a timely manner, the better it will be. By 1875, we begin to see metal buckets come online. Again, the problem is they were lead soldered. We still see those buckets in use today because they didn't pull lead out of that solder for a long time. So be very careful when you buy used equipment in the maple industry. If it was made prior to about 1981, 1982, I'm willing to bet my farm it has lead in it. Buy those lead test strips, test everything before you buy it because almost everything had lead before that. So where did my, all right, I don't know what happened. So about 1870s, things began to change in the maple industry. What happens around 1870? 1865, 1870. Was it? Civil War. Civil War. So big thing was the Civil War ended. All of our syrup used to be made into sugar cakes. Well, the train lines were rebuilt. Slaves were freed. It was no longer socially unacceptable to buy cane sugar. They've also figured out new advances in the refinement of cane sugar. And the price per pound plummeted, and it put most of the maple industry out of business, the big guys. But Americans had gotten hooked on the flavor. About that same time, we had advances in clarifying it. We had advances in bottling it in glass and canning it. And so we begin to see a switch over from sugar cakes to maple syrup. And then by the 1880s, 1900s, we really saw an uptick in the maple evaporators, the modern flu type evaporators. They really have not changed since about the 1880s, 1890s. The design of those flu type evaporators, which increased the surface area by another seven or eight orders of magnitude. It was a monumental shift from a flat pan. And so in that little evaporator that I'm standing behind, as a drop of sap enters it, it will spend no more than 18 minutes in there before it's either lifted off as steam or it turns into maple syrup. It is that rapid of a boil. It is pretty impressive. If that was a steam evaporator, it would happen even faster. So most of the industry, and we'll talk about that in a minute, is going to steam. By the 80s, we see that what we called the, the California lead scare, all right? California forced us to look inside our own industry and say, where can we get the lead out? Because one, maple trees do not have an affinity to take up naturally occurring lead. They're not, it's not gonna be in the sap. It comes from the taps, it comes from the buckets, it comes from the tanks. So we switched to tubing, to plastic tubing to gather it. We switched to stainless tanks that are welded, not soldered. We switched the evaporators out that were tin and soldered to stainless that were welded. And we've gone from being tin cans to either plastic or glass. So we've seen a big shift. By the 90s, there were additional technologies that you, you recover the steam that's boiling off. You pressurize that into what's called a steam away. You put it back through raw sap. You get 80% more efficient boiling because you're using all of that steam's energy coming off the flat pan and, or the flue pan and you're boiling it again. By the, by the 2000s, 2010, we began to see an uptick in vacuum use, high vacuum use. You know, a perfect vacuum I think is around 29 inches of mercury. We're seeing producers trying to achieve 27 to 28 inches of, of vacuum in their mainline system. To put that into perspective, we have 35 miles of 5 16 inch tubing running tree to tree in the woods. We have 10 miles of mainline distributing that vacuum into our woods. The new systems with high vacuum and plastic tubing, we used to be able to say on an average year with a bucket, you're good if you get a quart of finished maple syrup per tap hole. So one quart per tap hole. We now think it's a bad year if we don't make at least a half a gallon per tap hole. On the order of we want to be in that 0.69 range, 0.5 to 0.69 gallons per tap hole. 
at $50 a gallon, that's a huge jump in profit retail when you go from a quart and that's adding a high vacuum pump. So um, most recently, um, they've even looked at reverse osmosis machines. We looked at the, the naval uh, way that they get fresh water on board ships and they run them through these high pressure filters. They're ROing salt water. They throw the salt back into the sea, they keep the purified water. We took those units, scaled them to maple, and under high pressure, we shove sugar molecules and sap against the membrane. Pure water goes through the membrane, the sugar drops out, and we keep the, we keep the sugar and we keep the minerals with it. We pollute our pond with pharmaceutical grade pure water. When you think we bring in a hundred and, well, let's, easy math. We bring in 100,000 gallons of raw sap a year. One pass through the RO takes out 75,000 gallons. I only have to boil 25,000 gallons of water. Huge energy savings, because that machine can run while I'm sleeping. Now we look at the ultra high RO, all right? One pass will take that 100,000 gallons of sap it'll turn it into 5,000. It's an Im immense savings. Um, and that's where the industry is going. Why is the industry going there? It's because of the drive and demand. We're seeing producers that used to start with 50 taps or 100 taps start at 5,000. We're seeing investors f from Europe come in. You know, I have one in, in Michigan, they added 50,000 taps. They've never made syrup before. They know what their return on investment will already be because they have an outlet in Europe. And we're seeing them add 50,000 taps per year now. And so it's now become an industry and it's being driven because so many people are being exposed to syrup on the hobby scale and they're exposing their friends, but they can't produce enough for what their friends need or want. And so we're seeing that local market drive an industry from the ground up because they're exposing to so many more people. So it really, this is, this is one of those things. It does not need to be an expensive hobby to start with. I caution you though, you start at the hobby level, almost everyone grows. That's just fair warning. You're going to get bigger. If you have taps available to you, you will grow. If you don't have taps available to you, you know you will be addicted because you will tap your neighbors and then you will find more taps. So at the, at the base level, you need some way to get the sap out of the tree. So you need a sharp drill and they, ha they have maple drills and I'll talk to you about those in a minute. They have these spiles which tap into the tree. You need some way to collect it, some way to store it, some way to boil it, some way to filter it, and then some way to package it. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. We talked already about those buckets, galvanized buckets, zinc coated. Let's not buy those anymore. Stainless buckets are great. The farm stores now, there's enough interest in Iowa. They have a maple section. You can buy all of these supplies at Tyson's and at Fleet Farm. You can buy the plastic buckets. You can buy the, the uh, stainless buckets with the lids. I caution you because every maple producer is cheap. We try to buy everything as cheap as possible or make it ourselves. Word of caution, make sure it says food grade on it and make sure food grade is actually food grade. You see those IBC totes that everybody sells on Craigslist and on Facebook and they put right on their food grade. They're not all food grade. That was an additive. You know, a lot of that is like phosphoric acid. There's a lot of different things that are still called USDA, FDA food grade that shouldn't have raw sap in them. Also, anything with a flavoring in it. The cheap guy in me ran up the Blue Bunny because I knew somebody there and said, hey, can I buy some of your buckets, your ice cream buckets? Sure, how many do you want? They're 25 cents a piece. I was in heaven, I bought like 400, came back. First batch of syrup we made, there's an odd flavor here. Handed it to my wife. Huh, did you drop a mango in here? And she's like, all I taste is mango. <laughs> Go to the bucket, mango flavoring. I triple rinse those with acid. I, you cannot get it out. So no more frosting, no more flavoring, no more 
vinegar buckets. You can get those at the restaurants because they almost always will give you their dill pickle buckets. You will make dill pickled syrup. Go and, and almost all Menards, uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, they now have buckets and right on the side of them it is food grade, you know, pure new plastic food grade. Get those and, and get yourself some taps. For storage though, um, I have a place where I live that they get in 55 gallon poly barrels and it's just vinegar. Would you caution of buying your, a brand new poly drum for storage? Or if it's brand new and never had vinegar in it, sure. But not something that? Not something that ever had vinegar touch it because it will taste like vinegar. You can't, it impregnates into that plastic. Okay. Okay. And you will always have vinegar. I've, okay. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and you cannot get okay. that. It just, it comes through and, and I will caution because I grade syrup on the international market. 60% okay. yep. of all samples that we normally grade, we have to blend because they are off flavors. Okay. So, and it can be everything from Clorox because they thought they were sanitizing it well and they didn't rinse it. It can be buddy syrup. There's buy new stuff okay. don't try to and i've done it all i've done it the cheap way you can do bags all right those are food grade bags 25 cents a piece i will caution you the first year the deer and the raccoons are going to chew on them because they're novel after that yeah so we tell people the first year buy 30 percent more than you think you're going to put out there because you're going to need to replace them after that you're in that 10 percent but these are throw away. You don't wash them. You throw them away at the end of the season and you're done. So just know there is some waste in that. Do not use milk jugs. There's no way to clean a milk jug so it doesn't taste like spoiled milk. And we've tasted syrup collected from milk jugs and you can pick up spoiled milk. Now we say that I am not the best syrup taster in the world. Almost all the commercial producers in the world will not hire guys. They only hire women. They have a much better taste palette and they are much better at developing syrup profiles. My wife can taste things at a much finer concentration than I can. She can pick up somebody that uses bleach at a much lower concentration. They are, she is a super taster. 25% of all women are super tasters. Very few men are super tasters. So if you're gonna do this, have a, have a lady taste it. Sap bags, 25 cents a piece. You're seeing a lot more of those come on the market. Sap bag holders, you're, so these give you the price. Um, so you don't need a lot of money into it. Um, and just be cautious what you buy online. Most of the older equipment is 7 16 inch in size. All right. Up until about 10 years ago, everything was 7 16 Now things have switched over to 5 16 If you're going to run a vacuum system, go with 5 16 If you're running a bucket system, be careful if you drop down into that smaller range. Your, your um, extraction is going to be a little bit lower uh, just from the sheer size of the opening that you're going to make into the tree. If you do the right forest management, it doesn't matter if you tap with 7 16 or 5 16 You do the right forest management and those crowns are actively growing, it should seal that wound over, that hole in the tree, within about two growing seasons. All right? People always ask, how much sap do we take from a tree? And let's talk a little bit about that. So whether you're doing the 5 16 or the 7 16 Industry standard is one, about an inch and a half to two inches deep. Very slight upward angle, if at all. It's best just to go straight into that tree, all right? You hang the bucket, now you wait. Now, you can and are doing damage to the tree when you put a hole in it, all right? There's no way around that. But if you follow the guidelines, we're still tapping trees that my relatives tapped, all right? So... It's not that we take out too much sugar. It's not that we take out too much water. It's that we actually break the vascular structure of the tree. So if you start to pop too many holes in that tree every year, you're destroying the straws that transport water from the roots and the sugars up to the leaves. So 
I am conservative when we tap. One tap is 10 to 15 inches. Two taps, 16 to 24. Some of the newest research that's come out of the Northeast, they don't recommend anything over two taps. Doesn't matter if the tree is four feet in diameter. What they're looking at is it is not a perfectly linear response. More taps does not equal the same amount of sap. What happens is the tree has an internal pressure all to its own, depending on the root system and the weather. The more holes you put in it, the more it screws with its internal pressures. So unless you're running ultra high vacuum, you never achieve a one-to-one -one gradient on more taps. You also break the vascular structure too many times, causing that tree to slow its growth down. So if you stick with two taps in every tree, you will tap those trees forever. We always make a new hole every spring in that tree, all right? We always move over and around and up and down because that sap, when you drill a hole in a tree, you're gonna get sap from about a quarter of an inch right and left of that hole, but about 10 to 16 inches above and below the tap hole. That's all that zone of sap wood that you're tapping into. So you always move over. You never wanna tap directly above or below an old tap hole. You just won't get sap. Part of the tree's response in the spring to being tapped is that tap hole will dry out and it will compartmentalize and it will stain the wood. You tap into stained wood next year, you don't get sap. It's the tree's natural ability to wall itself and to protect itself. Is there a minimum distance from the ground? So minimum distance from the ground to tap. We used to tell people, Need a shoulder, all right? Mainly for the convenience of getting a bucket from the tree. There is not a lot of difference if I tap at my ankle or if I tap 10 feet up the tree, what the sugar content will be. So a lot of times in the high snow, we're tapping down here with our snowshoes and at the end of the year, we're pulling. So that has gone, it's convenience for you. We tap evenly all the way around the tree and within a broad zone. I put this picture up because here's in Iowa. These people have made syrup for a long time. The problem is the tap zone, you can see there's a tap, there's a tap, there's a tap, there's a tap, uh, there's a tap, there's a tap, there's a tap, there's a tap, uh, there's a tap. Here's a big crack. There's about 20 taps all within about four inches. So a couple problems, trees respond to that by putting callus tissue in. So you can actually see the bulge, mm -hmm. okay? Not good to get sap from callus tissue. Also, when you take a tree that's, you know, several tons, and over the 20 years, you're tapping in one zone, an inch and a half to two inches deep, all you're doing is you're weak. You, you've just told it exactly where it's gonna break in a windstorm, all right? So, when you put a hole in a tree, it will be there for life. That hole is there for life. It doesn't seal itself in, it seals itself off from the outside and grows new wood over top of it. And so this is not what you want to do when it comes to tapping. You move over a few inches and up a few inches, you move over a few, up a few, you kind of corkscrew yourself around and then you come down and you start lower, going up, um, and you're always avoiding directly above or below an old tap hole for 20 or 30 years and then the tree's grown enough that you can go right back in on clear wood. So you really have to learn. You also, the picture shows this crack. So this crack probably happened one of two ways. The tree was frozen when they tapped it and a lot of trees get tapped when they're frozen because the big guys have to start so early tapping or they never get them done. Or the person drove it in too hard. Most likely they drove it in too hard. So when we tap our trees, we use the smallest ball peen hammer you can find, all right? And all of those spouts, whether you're buying a metal one or a plastic one, they all kind of have a, a sweet spot that will seal against the wood. So what you're doing is you hear tink, 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 tunk. The tunk is where you stop because it has seeded itself and it has sealed itself to that you hit it one more time and it most likely will crack the bark. And once you crack it, out goes the sap in the crack, out goes the vacuum, you've lost you know, a, a vacuum leak. So 
you want to buy the smallest hammer possible. Don't have kids. You know, I love Iowa State. But I sent some kids out to tap, and I couldn't figure out why in the world I wasn't getting any sap to run. And I get there, and all of the spouts, they drilled an inch and a half hole, and they hammered those suckers in about an inch. You know, just because you make that hole, that hole is a way for there to be a chamber for sap to leak into and then leak down the spout, all right? So just be careful how hard you drive those, those taps. So let's talk about sap storage. So again, we're making a food-based product. We want to be able to sanitize it at any point. And we buy old milk tanks. If it's stainless, food grade, we try to buy them because you can sanitize them, you can rinse them. Again, 24 to 48 hours, well, excuse me, 12 to 24 hours. After 24 hours, if the sap is at room or at ambient temperature, whatever that be, is 40 or 50 degrees, you lose one color grade. And it's because it's begun to ferment. It's begun to have bacterial growth in it. So we sanitize our tanks after every day when it runs, we sanitize it. Um, a lot of times we used to use Clorox. Well, you can't rinse Clorox enough, all right? You still will have a residual. So we've switched over to the beer sanitizer, you know, the sanitizers, that suite of like Star Sand and some of those others. It's, you know, a, a, what is it, an ounce per five gallons or half an ounce per five gallons. It's on contact sanitizer. It works great. You don't pick up flavors. You can rinse it well. You can't sanitize enough. Potassium bisulfate and citric acid in the winery? In the winery business, the, yep. Yeah. We, it would work. I don't know the cost though. Again, remember I said we're cheap. cheap yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then, then it probably would. Yeah. You know, the only thing is a lot of times when we look at the tank sanitizers and the equipment sanitizers, those are actually labeled and it's probably the same since it's in a winery. It's probably labeled for food. You got to look if it's a, you know, an on contact, you know, um, cleaner or a storage vessel cleaner. I mean, we got star sand too, but yep. you know, Yep. Spray. Easy spray, sanitize it. Um, we've learned a lot over the years about keeping sap cold. If you can't boil it, if you, if you gather sap all week and are going to boil it on a weekend, you're going to make road tar. It's going to be really dark, really flavorful, but it's not of the quality you want unless you can keep it cold. So now we're working with a lot of producers to chill their sap, either in a walk-in cooler or a lot of these dairy tanks have compressor hookups. So you could actually chill the sap in the tank. So all of our tanks are being hooked to compressors this year. We will, as you concentrate it through an RO system, you can drop the temperature down. So at about eight to 10% sugar, I can take that temperature at 28, the sap doesn't freeze. But below 32, my microbial activity drops way off. Not that it doesn't stop, but it drops way off. And I can hold sap seven days before I boil and with no loss of quality. The warmer it gets at the end of the season, the darker the syrup gets because of the bacterial growth. We can't keep it cold enough. It's in the lines. And so we just try to handle it within 12 to 24 hours. But we see a lot of small producers using plastic, you know, food grade plastic. I have some of these tanks. They're a bugger to clean. Those top bungs are eight inches. You can't get in there and scrape it. Um, you can't sanitize it. And the biggest knock I have on these, and I'm not knocking Ace Rotor Mold, it just, I pulled that image off. The biggest problem there, they're not a bottom drain tank. You can't get all of the liquid out of that tank without flipping it over and drilling a hole in the top of it to get all of it out. And so, my, and, I, and I talked to one of the tank guys here, they now have a product line where you can drain the, full, the tank fully. They've had enough complaints that the tank sits there and, and uh, gets stuff in the bottom. I actually saw this at a producer, small hobby. I begged him to throw that out. He's like, well, I only use it for sap. And I was like, well, I hope you would only use it for sap. But he had it in what I call an ice bank. It was on the north side of his house. You know, he covered it in, in uh, ice, end of the season. And, but again, food grade? No. Again, he was not selling the syrup, thank God. He just gave it to his family. 
you have to understand the rule of 86. The rule of 86 means it takes a lot of sap to make one gallon of syrup. And the average sugar maple tree is 2% sugar coming out of the tree. It takes 43 gallons of raw sap to turn one into syrup, which means I have to lose 42 gallons of water somehow to concentrate it enough to make one gallon of syrup. That's the hard part. That's what takes the time. But if we look at little home ROs, all right, you can buy very expensive ROs. You can go to Menards and buy those canisters and the sock water filter and a little pressure pump and you can make your own for about $250, all right? What that does in one pass, it takes out half the water. So now I've gone from needing to boil 43 gallons of water to 21 and a half. Huge savings. But I can loop that outflow concentrate line back in on the tank and let it sit there and run all night. The max that I've gone to on a full tank of sap is about seven and a half degrees bricks percent sugar. So somewhere just north of 10 gallons. So instead of boiling 43 gallons off to make one, I got to boil about 10 to 11. Huge savings when you're manning the, the wood stove or the, the fireplace. To put it in perspective, our big unit, we run it through an RO, we do about 2,000 gallons an hour through our big RO. Our evaporator eats a quarter of a ton of firewood every 13 minutes. But we're also producing a drum and a half of syrup every hour. The new modern evaporators that run on steam, so some of our friends, they tap about 500,000. They have four steam evaporators. Each evaporator boils and produces a thousand gallons of syrup an hour. So when they're up, they have a hundred employees. When they're running, imagine handling 4,000 gallons of syrup per hour is what they do. And most of their syrup is not liquid. It goes into a confections retail market. So price per gallon that they get, and we get 50 a gallon for retail. They make 125 when they turn it into maple cream. I mean, the value added side of it is where we all need to go. So a lot of different people have made hobby scale ROs, you know, for the maple industry. The problem is I showed you the one that you could make from the farm, you know, from Menards for 250. These guys are all in the three to $5,000 range, but they will last you forever. You, you change the membranes out every probably five to 10 years. Let's talk about boiling because this is where all the fun happens. We see all sorts of different scales. Most people start with a turkey fryer, okay? But again, same problem with the kettle. It's this deep volume of sap and no surface area. So then they throw out the kettle and they get these chafing dishes. So they put that on there. That's a huge increase in efficiency. Then they go to, oh, well, heck, I've got these old wash basins. Let's boil that. Zinc coated, of course. Really good, two gallons an hour. And then they say, well, heck, we'll find a welder. He'll weld us up a flat pan, and we'll, we'll do that, three to eight gallons per hour. What's funny is, so uh, moving to Michigan, my guys had never made maple syrup, and I got them a three-by-five flat pan. I said, guys, it's got to be level. You put the sap in it, boil it away. There's a natural evolution, at least for guys, that if it's boiling well, we can make it boil faster. So I got them started, came back out 20 minutes later. They had put a chimney out. I should have a picture of this, but they had a chimney rigged up really good. 20 minutes later, came back outside. They had taken a computer fan and rigged it up. 20 minutes later, they had melted said computer fan, but boy, were they boiling. <laughs> They got a squirrel cage fan, put it into a tube, flattened that tube out, put it there, and it was a jet engine out the chimney. But boy, did it boil. They made so much beautiful syrup. And that was the evolution over an hour and a half of guys that had never made syrup. They had figured out ways. And that's what sugar producers really are. They're kind of inventors. 
you know, they're cheap because they don't want to just buy a very expensive evaporator. And you can do this just with your local welding shop and some ingenuity. Do it far away from the house, all right? Literally, the flames were coming out. They had power cords. Um, it's, a, it's a great time of year. What, why you grow is not because you want to. How we began to grow in our family is I would bring friends home from school. They all got to tap a tree, which meant we had more sap. Well, then we were spending longer time boiling, so we got a bigger cooker. The neighbor just showed up with it. He was a welder, which meant you could boil more trees and have more fun. And then, you know, things happen and you start tapping hundreds of trees. You begin to sell the syrup and see that, well, there is profit involved with this. You go to a farmer's market, you don't even have to put a sign out. People know what maple syrup is and they pay a premium for that local grown product. So you begin to get more and more boiling. But this is our first um, little evaporator. This is 40 inches wide, 12 feet long. All right, so it boils a lot. Our new machine is a little different. You'll see that in a minute. But you can burn standard firewood. You can burn fuel, uh, wood pellets, fuel oil, steam. If I was going to do it on a commercial manner, it would either be fuel oil or steam because the new modern burners and the new evaporation uh, steam away pans, we now have producers telling us they are making a gallon of maple syrup with that less than a half a gallon of fuel oil. I can't cut firewood for what I can buy a half a gallon of fuel oil, number two fuel oil. That's how efficient these manufacturers have gotten. And so you can retrofit the old wood fires to a Carlin uh, fuel oil burner. That's the new one. Um, and actually, that actually isn't a good picture of it because um, so the pans are ours, steam hoods are ours. We actually have a double-decker pan on the back collecting the steam, and we still burn with wood. We have a, a wood gasifier unit, and so we can use green wood. We can use, once you get a hot fire under it, um, it, it delays the amount of time we have to, to fire that unit. So they've really come a long way. These are continuous flow. A drop of sap goes in one end, comes out the other end in a few minutes as liquid syrup. Everything else lifts off as steam and goes out, out the roof as, as steam. So the old, you know, if we looked at these, let me go backwards. Those guys are what we call a batch process. You put the syrup in, you boil it down, you pull it off, you finish it in the house, get it close. And then you start with the continuous flow. And, and that is, like we said, once you get it up and running, it never shuts off. So, density is probably one of the biggest problems we have with maple syrup and why we have to disqualify a lot of syrup. If it is under 66% sugar, it will ferment or it has a much higher chance. So if you're ever at the store and you see the bottom of this uh, plastic jar and it's bulged out, it's probably fermented. You open it up and it goes fizz, you know it's fermented. It's not good. It means they didn't cook it far enough. So a hydrometer is just that. We're testing the density of that hydrometer with that, with that hydrometer. And there's always two scales on a hydrometer. And there's two red lines. One at the top is the hot test. At 211 degrees, we test the density. The bottom red line is a cold test at 60 degrees. You really have to learn and read the instructions in your hydrometer because every hydrometer is calibrated a little differently. If you're testing your syrup at 208 degrees rather than 211, it throws your hydrometer off. And so you have to adjust based on the temperature. And that's one of the things people almost always screw up when they're starting off is testing it. It's better to be thicker than thinner when it comes to syrup. But at 69% sugar, it begins to crystallize and you put rock candy in the bottom of your jar. So just to show you, that is cold test, 60 degrees, and it's, the red line is riding above the meniscus of that maple syrup. So it's, it's over the density, so we know it's, it's good syrup, it's not too far over that it's going to blow 69%. Uh, so about half the samples, eh, not half, 
30% of the samples we kick out of international competitions, they're not at the right density and or they're not at the right color class. And USDA, I don't know where it's the next one. USDA has four color classes. All right, we used to have three. We, we wanted to join and make it standard with Canada. There are four color classes. We'll see an example of that in a minute. All syrup throws what's called nitre. It's a precipitate, or it precipitates out of the syrup when we boil, all right? And so we have to filter that out or it leaves this um, bottom ring in, in the bottom of your, your uh, syrup. And so we started off using synthetic cone filters and they would just, Orlon filters, it would, would uh, drip through. It's a sticky mess. It has to stay really hot. They're not that, they're good, but they're a pain to use and you're cleaning them all the time. Pretty much everybody now, even the small guys, have gone to plate and frame filter presses. And the small users, the hobbies, they're just using the hand pump, all right? And that will get it crystal clear. We add a little bit of diatomaceous earth, which is food grade diatoms, crushed up. That is the filter agent. So we have the filter press and the paper. We add our diatoms or our crushed DE. That packs against the filter paper, and then when you peel that off when you're done, you'll see all of the brown and the sugar sand and the nitre packed in against those white filter agent, and it comes out crystal clear, and it won't ever suspend after that. The problem you run into is when you try to push it and try to get too much syrup through your filter press, and then you blow a filter paper. Then you're back to square one. You have to reheat it all, filter it again. Every time you filter it, or every time you reheat syrup though, and you get it close to 219 degrees, it begins to precipitate more nitre out of it. So be very careful when you reheat syrup. Every time you reheat syrup, you make a darker and darker maple syrup. All right, those are just the Orlon filters and the, and the filter press, or the, it, it's a gravity. That is the filter press. The one on the left is a little hand filter press. The one on the right is a, a pump system. That's actually ours on the right. And it's an Obador for pump, so it forces it through. And we have blown filters just because we weren't watching. And so our, our next one's going to be, uh, instead of a mechanical pump that doesn't shut off, it's going to be a, an air-driven diaphragm set of pumps because you will not blow filters with an air diaphragm pump. These are the grades, all right? And so they have grading kits. So you put your sample of syrup that uh, this bottle, it comes with uh, several bottles. You put your syrup sample in there and then you start to move it around and say, okay, is it darker than this or is it lighter than this? And you move it through the known standards. You can also buy um, a set of, of um, it, it measures the light transmittance through the syrup, and that's a fail proof. I mean, it, it goes against the known standard. So when you see syrup labels out there under USDA label, it has to have the new grading classification. So it has to say golden, delicate flavor, amber, robust, dark, very robust flavor, very dark, you know, extremely so it's all measuring how much light goes through it. So the more light goes through, the, the lighter it is. Normally, two things will drive color, or actually three things will drive color. The soils that your trees are growing on will drive color. Heavier clay soils are, are more of that medium amber colored flavor. Lighter sand, lighter gravel will make lighter syrup, all right, just from the terroir of the the, for the trees. How long you hold your sap. If you f handle it really fast, you'll make lighter sap or syrup. The temperature is what drives it. And then how long you boil it in the evaporator. We can back the heat down on our evaporator and let it boil longer and not as hard and it caramelizes longer and makes it darker and darker. So in a season where we're making a lot of light amber syrup, and we know our clients want medium amber syrup, we actually will either let the sap sit for an extra 12 hours or we'll turn the tank chillers down 
or up, so they, they uh, warm the sap up. We will make darker syrup. So it's kind of, we, we play with the color and the flavor profile by how long we let that sap sit if we're not getting it uh, to where we want it. So the other big thing is we can all syrup hot. If you hot pack it, it stays good for a long time. We pack all of our bulk syrup in stainless drums. Light can't get to it, oxygen can't get to it. You pack it hot, it stays good for decades. As soon as you open it, you either refrigerate it, and that goes for even in the containers, um, or you bring it back up to temperature and pack it back hot again, because it will spoil, it will grow mold on it. So glass is really good, it's pretty. The problem with glass, you, I have five minutes left. I only have like one slide, so we're good. The problem with glass, as light shines through it, it begins to degrade the syrup. It makes it darker and darker and more flavorful. So if you're gonna pack in glass, you pack in glass, put it back in that brown box, put it in a cabinet in, a, in more of a stable um, environment. So basements are great because it, it doesn't fluctuate hot and cold. Um, tin was really good to sell syrup. A lot of syrup got sold in tin containers. Lead solder was an issue. We now see producers coming back online, um, equipment, can producers, that are using tin, but they're using non-lead solder. And so that, that's gonna change. Um, the plastic maple jugs. It used to be we could put them in plastic and hold it for a long time but those a lot of times were, were BPA lined and we don't want BPA in our syrup anymore. So now we've pulled that out of the jug manufacturing and now we tell people, you buy it, use it within six to 10 months because it can have, it, it's no longer an oxygen barrier through it. So you can pick up flavors, you can, you know, don't leave a plastic jug of syrup in your uh, spice cabinet. If you leave it in there for a year, it's going to start to pick up flavor. And so we keep all ours in drums until we know we're going to have a, a sales, you know, and then we'll break a drum and, and, uh, and bottle that. So I only have one slide left. So it's, it's, a really, it's a growing market. People don't think of it in Iowa, but Northeast Iowa makes a ton of maple syrup. You don't hear about it because they don't really have to do a lot of marketing. The local folks know it. They have their old local out, outlets for it. Um, and we have producers in Iowa, you know, several are in the six to 16,000 tap range. They're selling their dairy herds to make syrup. You know, my uncles think it's a bad year if they're not sold out by the 1st of July, retail. So you make it, people will buy it. You can also make syrup out of birch. You can make syrup out of walnut, all right? Don't tap a veneer quality walnut tree though. If you, know, if you got some in the hedgerow that's really junky, they make, it makes beautiful syrup. It's got a real nutty taste, but it is really good. And it runs a lot of sap. And they're, they're fairly sweet. They're in the one to 1.5% range, 2% range. So yeah, we have trees. See, that's what I have. I have walnut and I have uh, hickory. Yep. I have no experience with hickory. Yeah, I've heard hickory can do it. So I have a lot of, but I'm concerned about like, so the shag bark hickory, tapping it and getting a good, you know, a seal and everything, so. I have no experience with hickory. I know, I saw a, a several articles where people did it a couple of different ways. They extracted it from bark. Yeah. Which I, I'm, I'm going to poke a hole in that tree and see. I would say start small and, you know, make a little bit and see what it, I, I have, I don't even know what it'll taste like. I know walnut is good. My wife's cousin, he taps a lot of trees, a lot more than I thought, actually, three, four, five hundred, six hundred, uh, maybe even more than that in terms of number of taps. Um, makes some really good walnut syrup, but that's along the bluffs in, in La Crosse, Wisconsin walnut, side. Yeah. Okay. So, but yeah, don't poke a hole in a really nice walnut tree or you lose money. Yeah. So, but same thing, you know, you're bringing it to 66 to 69% sugar and 
Can it hop? Is there a minimum diameter before you? On those walnuts? Yeah, to tap. I'd probably still follow the same guidelines. You know, if you go to like the Canadian Organic certification, they're going to say eight inches because mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of big trees. They're on some pretty bad soils. So they say eight inches, and I think that's too small. Um, the Vermont organic rules are nine inches. Everyone else in, in the U.S. is using a 10-inch minimum. Okay. But you look at those trees, they're, just, they're growing on granite, and they are just tough trees. So they have to tap smaller ones. Sure. So if we wanted to start and plant, I mean, long-range vision, right, before we can start tapping them, what kind of trees? The sweetest ones you can buy. And so I say that Mother Nature put on this earth sweeter trees. And a lady with the Vermont and the Forest Service back in the 50s tested trees all over New England. And she found trees that ranged anywhere from 4% to 10% sap sweetness, naturally. She grafted those, put them into a plantation in Grand Isle, Vermont. And my first job as a freshman in college was to greenwood cut those, turn them into grafted or into cuttings that rooted and plant them out into a plantation. And so fast forward, however many years is that? 25, 30, 25. And I now have F1s off of the trees I started. We tested the mothers, so my seed crop, the second round, anywhere from 4% to 9% from the mother tree. When we did it before, it seems, because we've isolated them, so we know they, they had to kind of force breed, everything tells us they will be sweeter than the mother they come from. And so I would get yourself super sweets, because if you, you know, remember that graph, if I have 10% right. sap sweetness, I, I only need to boil what, seven, eight, nine gallons? Um, now, there's a tipping point. What we found is five, six, seven is the sweet spot in terms of volume of sap and sap sweetness. Like eight, nine, ten, it's, it's making a lot of sweet sap, or it's making sweet sap, but it's not making a lot of it. And so, you know, I'm aiming for five, six, seven to put out on the landscape. And uh, so we have a project that just went in, um, the seeds are being grown right now in the greenhouse to push them. But we aim to have about 15,000 ready to go in another two years. And we'll test them, we'll play with them, figure out what, and then put them out in a, you know, see if they're going to survive. We're going to plant them across a range of sites. You want a test plot? I hear that a lot. Yeah. Maybe. You know, I know they'll probably, but if it were me in Iowa, and if you're in Iowa, yeah. I would probably plant black maple. Black maple and or a hybrid of sugar and black. So if you look in Iowa, there's a few counties east and west of Highway 35 where they're hybrid. Okay, East of that line, almost all sugars. West of that line, black. Blacks are more drought tolerant. All right, And so if you follow the climate models for here, we're probably going to get more variable weather, big rains and a lot less in between. I would plant the black because it gives as sweet or sweeter sap than a sugar maple in this environment, and it's adapted for drought. And you're looking at a 30 year time frame before you can plant, or before you can tap from a, from a little guy. For the grandkids, right? For the grandkids. Now you can fertilize, you can fertilize those trees and push them. And we have a plantation, it averages 6%, and it now is that big around. So you can push them a little bit. Open grown, 25 foot spacings, plant Christmas trees in between them or anything else in between them and push them. But yeah, grandkids. But you don't need very many acres. You know, at 25, that's probably 60 trees per acre. You get a couple acres, that's equivalent to a lot of, a lot of trees that are 2% sure. So anyways. How would they do with chestnuts? We got seven acres that we don't use. I'm thinking of what to do with that. I'm thinking of chestnuts. Do you have chestnuts there now, or do you want to think? Yeah. So, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, 
chestnut, I have a plantation of chestnuts up there where we're trying cultivars. I just need to save it, then I'm done. Yeah, no, you're good. I'm okay. just gonna go check that. Okay. Time, but thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, so we've had, when I was here, we had a lot of field days on chestnuts. The biggest issue I have when, when you try to compare numbers from different sales type pitches, the basic math on the back of the envelope doesn't work like what they're telling you. And I've heard enough of them in enough venues and their numbers change too much that I don't trust their numbers. If, if I trusted their numbers, I'd see it reflected in like other things. Like if they were making the money that they are supposedly could make, you'd see other differences in the outfit, the organization. Um, and I know there was a person that I, I unfortunately came in late to the game because he was having all sorts of problems. And he bought their numbers and planted 10 acres. And he's like, he's 10 years into it. And he's like, I'm not even a quarter to their numbers of their first year. Right. And so... I don't even think those, I think those trees went back into a corn and soybean field. And, and so he had a huge investment in those because he bought grafted seedlings. I, I think if you marry chestnuts to a different like intercrop and you multi-tiered it, perhaps. I unfortunately have heard enough different numbers. I don't trust the numbers. Yeah, I mean, the seven acres, we just got access to it. We put it in the culvert. Yep. So nothing's still back there. And it's on the opposite side of my farm. So it's something I don't want to go back to all that, that often. You know, so we put ours in up, up in, we have 18 or 13 different trials on 18 rows. We, even up there, where our, our climate's a little harder, so we got hardier stock. I would say here you're going to be faced with winter injury, with extreme cold. You're, it's colder, bitterer here. Yeah with higher winds than we are. We're, we're by the lake and we still don't know if we can get zones four or five to live. Um, and we had to install irrigation, which means you gotta manage it, which means there's a whole mess of problems that come with irrigation or fertilization. You gotta do really good weed controls. I mean, as good or more than with Christmas trees. Um, you got to be very careful what you use because it can, you know, pre-emergence will go into the tree. Pre nut crops are notoriously finicky about pre-emergent herbicides. I learned the hard way. Um, and so you got to be really good on your, on your weed control, what herbicides you use, when you use them. Uh, you're going to fight deer. You're going to fight squirrels. You're going to fight the winter. I don't know what to tell you. I would say don't put in seven acres. I mean, a grafted tree is 25 bucks, $22 if you buy them in bulk. You buy F1s for five to six, and even those are, that's a huge capital outlay. Um, you know, we set ours up, up north, uh, what do we do? 30, 30 foot and 20, between, 30 foot between the rows, 25 between the trees. And we mainly did that so we could cut hay in between them for, for a while, you know, a long time. Um, and I'm even thinking of backing that down and putting Christmas trees for several rotations within them, you know, just, just to maximize my per acre. I probably can get two or three rotations off of that before they really close in. And I don't know. I don't know. Be careful. Yeah. We're thinking... With the winery, you have Christmas trees as you come into the winery, and that'll get people out there in the winter. Yep. You know, Christmas trees are really, I mean, there's a lot of guys starting to retire, so it's a good time to get in. 